God, will you be with us today? Will you blow through our lives and our hearts through our brother Jerry Taylor? God, speak powerfully, mightily through your spirit by his mouth into our hearts is our prayer. Amen. today in the world as he was in the midst of unfolding the created order as we know it today. He has not lost interest in the creation of his hands, uh, especially when it comes to uh, the ultimate creation which houses his divine image which is the, the human being. I want to speak briefly today from the Old Testament prophetic book of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter beginning with verse 10. Jeremiah says, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. The topic I would like to speak upon this morning is spiritual discernment, spiritual discernment. One of the most difficult challenges in life is figuring out how to live life. A life without purpose leaves one feeling hollow, desolate, confused, chaotic, and dead inside. Living without purpose increases the volume on the vague inner voice that dangerously insinuates that life is not worth living. This toxic inner talk secretly contemplates ending it all. Life becomes an anxious traveling companion when it senses that we are lost and that we have no sense of direction. 
The lack of spiritual direction disturbs our confidence and our ability to be successful at living. This intense inner discontent drives people to seek direction and inner contentment from their neighbors, from institutions, from politicians, and from the broader society. Sadly, people that search for meaning from these human sources are left disappointed, pushed backwards, and abandoned. The inner self has become like a blighted inner city neighborhood. In the inner city of the self, we see spiritual poverty and signs of spiritual decay everywhere. In the inner city of the self, we see vacant lots of despair, overgrown by the weeds of hopelessness. In the inner city of self, hope has been obliterated, aspirations have been neglected, and faith has been frustrated. This horrible inward state of inner poverty is the root cause of severe pain, torturous loneliness, and devastating depression that exist even among those who possess the outer trappings of wealth and materialism. It is in this inner state of spiritual desolation and internal poverty of the soul that leaves people suffocating from an inescapable sense of extreme boredom. Despite economic prosperity, the affluent are often without rest in their souls. Inner boredom drives them like a drill sergeant, screaming, telling them, don't stop, keep running in the pursuit of expensive distractions costly amusements and entertainments that only produce short-lived thrills. The inner spiritual state of boredom is so severe that the drug industry is under the constant demand for synthetic drugs, synthetic pills that come in colorful bottles offering temporary relief. Personal vices and artificial fixes are unable to make people forget their unrelenting discontent and boredom. The only remedy that provides a hopeful way out of the spiritual poverty existing in the inner city of the self is to engage in the practice of spiritual discernment. Despite our national wealth and technological advancements, America today is in a spiritual crisis. The church in America today is in a spiritual crisis. We have a subtle sense that God has called us for such a time as this he has called us to live into the purpose for which he created us. We can feel the divine pull upon our lives to commit ourselves to carrying out this specific life's project that God has called us to fulfill. Until we clearly discern what God's purpose is for our lives, and until we begin to live in the pursuit of fulfilling that divine purpose, we will know nothing but the full-blown frustration that we experience as a result of not figuring out the real reason for our existence upon this planet. The frustration resulting from a lack of spiritual discernment cannot be overcome no matter how much we seek to ignore it, no matter how much we seek to escape from it, no matter how much we seek to kill it through the creative means of self-destructive and self-defeating behavior, 
Revitalizing the blighted inner city of the self requires complete and total surrender to the pursuit of God himself and to the pursuit of God's divine purpose for our lives. God is the only source that has the secret password to our lives. We cannot understand our life's purpose until we consult with the one who holds the password that can open up our lives to the discovery of our true purpose for being here. When we don't know the personal password to our lives, we begin to resent the people who constantly ask us about our future plans. We resent the scornful look that people give us when they sense that we don't possess a magical crystal ball that provides us with exact details of the plans for our future. Filling the need to provide answers to people about our future plans that we don't have can sometimes make us feel like failures and losers in the eyes of other people. Some people become physically sick from constantly living under the cloud of their community's condemnation for them not living up to the dreams and the expectations that everyone in their family and in their social circles had for them. The truth is that some people who expect an explanation from us about the future direction of our lives don't even know the future plans for their own lives. God, our creator, never intended for us to come up or to discover or to invent or to create our own plans for our own lives independently of God's direction and God's guidance. We are in this world not to be ourselves, but we are in the world for God to be God's self in and through us to the glory of God. That is why we don't have to be concerned about what people say about our names. What matters most is that name that is above every name, that one day every tongue is going to have to confess that name and every knee is going to have to bow and humble reverence to that name. That is a name that is above every name. And it doesn't matter what kind of knee you got, you can have a high class knee or a middle class knee or low income class knee or knee that doesn't have any class at all. Help me somebody. Eventually that knee is going to have to bow to the awesome supreme ruler of the universe. God said in Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and to give you a future. God knows the plans. If God knows the plans he has for us, then we simply need to know God so we can spiritually discern what God's plans are for us. God has the plans for each person's life. God has the blueprint and your life will not be fulfilling, it will not be meaningful unless you begin to construct your life according to God's blueprint. If we fail to discern God's plans for our lives, we will begin to live according to the plans that other people set for us. I have made a decision that the life that God has entrusted to me belongs to him. And I will not allow this life to be owned or operated by anybody other than God. The plans that other people make for this life, that's their plans, they're not God's plans. And I'm only held responsible for living this life according to God's plans. God says, I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you. I have plans to give you hope and a future. When we put 
our trust in God's plans to prosper us, we don't have to live in the fear of the plans that other people might have to harm us. When we know that God is for us, we don't have to fear anybody that has declared that they are against us. When you are under the umbrella of God's protection, there is no weapon that a human being can form against you that can prosper. I wish I had some help in here this morning. God says, I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you. We must put our confidence in God's plans and his plans are the plans that will empower us to overcome the fear of plots and plans that others may be making against us. It was on the other side of suffering that Joseph could say to his brothers, the very ones that sold him into slavery that ended him up in Egypt, Joseph could say to those same brothers who had to come back to him to receive food in order to avoid starvation. And his brothers thought that Joseph was going to be angry at them and that he would seek revenge and to seek retaliation against them for what they knew they had done against him. But Joseph had his eyes fixed on a greater purpose. So Joseph could say, your plans were meant to harm me, but God's plans were meant to prosper me and to give me a future. In other words, Joseph is saying, I don't have time to be mad. I am spending my time focusing on why God allowed me to go through what I went through in order to get me to what he wanted me to get to so that I could be of his service in this present hour. The practice of spiritual discernment is required in order to know God's plans for us. Spiritual discernment is when we consult with God about the plans that he has for our lives. Spiritual discernment is an expressed commitment to doing God's will at all costs. Nothing else should matter. God's will, God's plans for our lives should be our ultimate concern and should be our ultimate commitment. The spiritual commitment to doing God's will keeps us free from the carnal entanglements of this present world. As the sons and as the daughters of God, just like our elder brother Jesus, our ultimate desire is to become totally consumed with doing God's will. We see in John's gospel, in John chapter 4, verses 31 through 34, Jesus' absolute focus was on doing God's will. John says, meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? And then Jesus responded by saying, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus was totally consumed with doing God's will. Jesus was not consumed with trying to figure out what would make him politically popular. Jesus was not driven by a need for the world to know his name or to be celebrated as the greatest who ever lived. A focus on being great and a desire to make a name for ourselves reveal that we are driven more by self-will than by God's will. Paul reminds the church at Philippi of the work that God was doing in them. And you have to keep your eye and your focus on what God is doing in you rather than being distracted by what is happening around you. Philippians 1, 6, Paul says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you 
will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And then in Philippians 1.9, the apostle connects the important role of spiritual discernment to the knowledge of the fact that God is at work in us. And Philippians 1.9, Paul says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. And then Paul says further in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, he says, have the same mind as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Spiritual discernment also requires that we take off the carnal mind and put on the spiritual mind. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Spiritual discernment also requires that we rely upon the person and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul says, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Brothers and sisters, God has given us something that the world did not give us, and since the world did not give it to us, the world can't take it away. Oh, there are things going on in this world that will make the hair curl up on the back of your head even if you don't have any hair. Help me, somebody. But we know that God is still in control of this world. And our task is to remain focused, not on what the world is doing, but to remain focused on what God is seeking to do in us and through us in the world. And that is how we become light in the midst of darkness. But if we're out here fighting fire with fire, if we're out here retaliating against those who have harmed us, if we're out here trying to dominate and to defeat and to destroy one another, that is not a work that is approved by the Holy Spirit. We who live in this world understand that we have the Holy Spirit in us that reminds us that this world is not our home. We are just passing through here. So don't get fixated on what you are experiencing here and forget about what God has planned for you to experience in him here and where we are headed to. I'm here to say that we have to stop looking at the physical and forgetting that we are ultimately spiritual. There is something in you that is going to outlast your last breath. Can I get an amen? There is something in you that cancer can touch. There is something in you that Alzheimer's can touch. There is something in you that death itself cannot touch. And that's why we have to start looking at ourselves as being something more than physical matter. We are decaying and declining day by day in the physical, but in the spiritual we are being renewed day by day. There is revitalization going on in the inner city of the self. Help me somebody. 
And even though your body is going into decline, just like my hair is turning loose and turning white, amen? And some of y'all used to have that Coca-Cola shape. <laughs> and it's been transformed into a Dunkin' Donut. I'm not calling, <laughs> I'm not calling anybody out this morning. But all I'm saying is that we don't attach to this thing that walks around that we call a body. Your life exists in that body. And when it dies and goes back to the dust of the ground, there is something in you that is of God's nature that shall continue to live and to exist as long as God exists himself. And that is what we fixate upon. And so we knock on God's door. We whisper in God's ear. And we ask him every day that we get up, Father, what is it that you want to accomplish in and through this life today? And it doesn't matter how old or young you are, just know that God can still do amazing things with your life today at the age of 77 that he could do in your life at the age of 27. To God, time is nothing but a thought. And if you are able to discern through prayer and through solitude and through silence and study of the word what God is calling you to do in this current moment of history to make the church into what it should be, pursue that with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And God will bless you in the process to experience an internal peace that surpasses all understanding because something gives us a sense of security when we know that we are in alignment with God's will and to walk in that assurance that regardless of who destroys the body, they do not have the power to destroy the soul. So our task is to focus on what God is wanting to do in us and through us for this present moment of history. And don't just do it for yourself. Do it for the whole congregation because discernment is not only an individual responsibility, it is a collective responsibility. And you all are going through a period of transition as a congregation. We should not just put all of this on the responsibility of the elders of the church, but every member of this congregation ought to be setting aside specific times of prayer and solitude and silence. And I'm gonna throw fasting in there too, amen. Because how can we make wise decisions if we don't consult the God of all wisdom? He will help us to be able to see what we need to see in order to identify what is in the best interest of the congregation. Everybody has to participate in the discernment process on behalf of the collective community. The person who fails to practice spiritual discernment will be the weakest link in the chain. And so, whatever you do in your spiritual life, Whatever spiritual growth that you experience, it is not meant for you to keep it to yourself in a selfish manner. Everything that we do in our private spiritual lives, it is meant to be a benefit to the collective, to the body, to the church, and even to the world. And may God bless us as we continue to go deeper into the living, breathing, pulsating life of God that is still active in the world because it is still active in the lives of God's people. God is not dead. God is alive. I know he's living and I know that he's alive and I know that he's still concerned about his church. He's still concerned about the world and we have to wake up each morning with that reality in our mind that God is waiting to be encountered by us, to be embraced by us and for us to submit our will to his divine will so that he can do some miraculous things in our lives and through our lives. And you know what, when he does that, who gets the glory? 
He gets the glory because we know that God can do some things that no human being can do within and of themselves. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we come to you today with the entire week ahead of us and we are willing to leave the decision in your hand as to whether or not we will get from this Sunday to the next Sunday, but if you so choose to take us home with you, I pray, O oh God, that we are found worthy in your sight as having made nothing of ourselves in terms of trying to be great in the eyes of this world, but that we've been willing to humble ourselves in your presence and to allow your Holy Spirit to humble us in your presence so that you might get out of us all of the potential that you have placed in us so that the church can be made healthier and so that the world can be made healthier. And we know that this is the reason why we're here. And our souls, our souls get happy when we think about the time that we shall come back to you and to be totally in your presence without the accompaniment of flesh. We look forward to that day, but until then, we ask you, God, regardless of our age, we ask you to please, please make us aware. Help us to discern what your will is for our lives right now as we have these lives by stewardship and you owning them by ownership. Bless us now. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and our elder brother, and all the people of God said, amen. All right. May you go in peace and continue to walk in the practice of spiritual discernment. God bless you. Thank you.